So let us delve deeply into the new first panel. The first panel will be focusing on the discussion on trends in Israel's foreign policy. And when we discuss the main trends, it's important that we look at it in a certain context. When we look at the last 12 months in particular, there are several characteristics and attributes, basic attributes that characterize Israel. There are processes and things happening that are impacting the foreign policy. And Israel's foreign policy is very much directed at grappling with these challenges. Some of these developments have already been mentioned. The pandemic, COVID pandemic, is certainly one of the attributes of the last 12 months in the foreign policy must uh, be shaped uh, against the backdrop of this pandemic. We must cooperate with other international institutions and states and take part in the international effort and contribute our part. The limitations and opportunities um, presented by the pandemic will uh, are part of this uh, period of time and its characteristics and will continue to do so. The uh, crisis, the climate crisis is starting to finally uh, play its part or be considered as what it is. Israel cannot ignore it or overlook it. Israel must grapple with the issue of climate just as its neighbors should. There is a concern whereby perhaps the climate crisis will exacerbate existing political crises, but we can see in the necessity to grapple with it, a necessity that is shared by all in the world, to perhaps use it to collaborate and to promote peace between communities instead. The normalization agreements that Minister Fred has uh, mentioned and has described uh, at length uh, were signed with UAE, Bahrain and Morocco. Let's put it on uh, aside for a moment. And they have changed the way uh, that Israel is positioning itself in the Middle East and its working relations. Uh, so we have its impact. So if we set aside the impact of that on the PA and Iran, certainly reality has changed. There's a new uh, US administration at the White House, a Democrat. Um, administration, and Dr. Gorin mentioned it before, after four years of tight relations between Trump and Netanyahu, where the uh, Democrats were alienated and uh, distanced, now we have the Democrats in the White House. And so there is uh, a challenge, there is relations that need to be taken into account. And of course, there's a new government in Israel as well. After years of the foreign policy being led by Netanyahu, now we have a new government in place with new position holders, some of them interested in promoting a different approach and policy. And this too is a very important characteristic in the reality that the foreign policy of Israel is being shaped in. So when we're being aware of all of these characteristics and others, some of them have been mentioned by speakers, some of them have not been mentioned, will be mentioned later on. It is now time to shine a light on what is happening in the different arenas of the Israeli foreign policy to delve a little deeper and to see what could happen. And so our first panel will be comprised of two rounds. The first, we will have, in, during the first, we'll have our experts describe the challenges, trends, and more importantly, the opportunities in the different arenas of Israel's public and foreign policy. The second round, the second identical question round, we in, in it, we will have the experts based on the descriptions provided in the first round, what should be the new guidelines, the guiding principles of Israel's foreign policy for each of these arenas. We will begin with a former member of Knesset, Ksenia Svetlova, who is the director of the program on Israel Middle East relations at Mitvim Institute. Ksenia is a dear friend and she's a wonderful um, journalist. She covered uh, the area of the Middle East uh, for a long time, and now she focuses on it as a researcher. Whoever wants to follow what's happening in this area, please follow her publications. That way you can stay up to date and understand the big picture behind the current affairs. So Ksenia, if we want to understand what has happened over the last year and what is now happening in the Middle East, in order to be able to form Israel's foreign policy, what should we know? What is important for us to understand? Ksenia, the floor is yours. 
Hi everyone. And first of all, I have a question for you, or E. Do we have five spare hours to focus on each and every one of the important accomplishments and challenges that we will be facing and have faced in the last 12 months? I have five minutes. Oh, okay, I'll take five minutes then if that's all I've got. First of all, I would like to welcome the people here at the conference. It is nice to see, even though it is virtually, I hope that in the future we'll be able to hold a conference as we used to do conferences where we can see each other face to face and see you all there. I will focus, of course, on the combination of two processes. One of them began, we can mark it maybe not a year ago, but 20 years ago, Israel's attempt to get closer to the Gulf states. Now, because of the politically correct, we can't call it the Persian Gulf or the Arab Gulf. We don't call it that, we just call it the Gulf. And on the one hand, Israel continues in its effort to get closer, to make the circle of the normalized countries larger in the Arab world and to have new members join, even though it seems that in 2021, this trend has been curbed. By the end of the year, perhaps new developments will still take place, but the assessment is that we will not be seeing additional countries being added to this circle of a normalized state. And now this very welcome and uh, wonderful uh, development of these states in the Gulf and North Africa, we're talking about Morocco, of course, it seemed that last year when the government was different and there was another minister sitting uh, in, the in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, it seemed that the importance of the new agreements and new partners is greater than the importance of the older uh, allies and friends, Jordan and Egypt. Now, since July, the moments where the new government was formed, and even just before then, with the help of Minister Gabi Ashkenazi, we saw attempts to renew and improve the ties between Israel and Jordan. And in recent months, we are also witnessing greater openness by Egypt to make these relations warmer and expand them, especially economically. And the question is, and now I'm moving from to the challenges, will Israel manage to combine these two pathways into a, one single pathway, a regional pathway that will mean really broadening the circle of economic, political, diplomatic, cultural collaborations and cooperations with other states, whether it's older um, friends and uh, peaceful states or newer ones, uh, because we have one shared goal, nor Israel, neither Israel nor the other uh, partners in the Gulf uh, can allow bilateral relations, because we don't have a, a, a border or shared border, uh, we can't have our relations prosper while everything else crumbling. And when I'm talking about Others, other entities crumbling. I'm talking about the PA, I'm talking about Lebanon. And if the Israeli foreign policy will manage to combine what's already in existence, expand it and add to it the new relations that are being developed and are evolving very uh, rapidly over the last 12 months, we will be able to maybe not reach the new Middle East, so to speak, but a Middle East that is improved and far better than the one that we know now. And I know I only have two more minutes, so I will dedicate them to an issue that is usually not overlooked, but less discussed. And that is collaborations that are focusing on the academic area, collaborations between research institutes, between scholars, scientists, sociological, economic, uh, studies and so on. So we're seeing the beginnings of that, but not enough is being done in this area and not enough has been done over the last 12 months. And some might say that, yes, uh, we ha only had one year, we can only promote so much. We in Israel have, of course, 
uh, promoted the economic and the political areas, but we didn't really notice what's happening with the academic world. But there are already modest accomplishments in this area too. And it's very important to keep investing in them, in these projects, and to see before us the human relations, the human relationships, to use them as basis for long-term warm ties that are now being forged between Israel and uh, the region countries in the region and in terms of the opportunities if we are dreaming not about a kind of once off uh, adventure where we go, go to Dubai or Marrakesh and we visit but it, and, and then we all go back home and live in our own economic political bubble then we as Israel and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs where we see them to really there's a real renaissance there now and it's really uh, very very welcome uh, we should really be looking into the future, into the long range, uh, looking at establishing long term pro projects, uh, ecolo ec ecologically, of course, uh, water, climate. We see uh, developments with Jordan and the agreement signed by the Ministry of Energy and Jordan. And uh, we're now providing them uh, greater quotas of water. Egypt is also in crisis with water, and there's a lot we can do there. There's also Israeli technologies. We mustn't forget that we have discovered UAE and Bahrain recently, but many have mis discovered them long ago. And since Israel is so uniquely positioned in the Middle East and has ties and relations with the United States, with the EU, and here Europe is also featuring, if we connect all of these dots on the map, then we can really create a situation which is very beneficial in terms of exhausting the opportunities in all the areas that we delve in, whether it is the political or the cultural, technological, academic, and economic. Thank you very much, Ksenia. You're talking about uh, tremendous shifts in the Middle East, and you're discussing the great opportunities, the opportunity to forge warm ties and to use them beneficially. I would like to shed some light on the Palestinians and Israel's relations with the Palestinians. And the best way to do that is to ask uh, Dr. Lior Hertz director of the program on Israeli-Palestinian peacemaking at the Institute. So since after years of managing the conflict and the different and the changes and, and, and shifts in the Middle East and in the United States and in the Israeli government, do you also see changes in your area? Do we see new opportunities or anything evolving there? Thank you very much uh, to the organizers of this conference. And thank you, Roe. I want to talk about the complexity of this arena, challenges and opportunities. Let's talk about a few domains that you mentioned. First of all, the Israeli domestic internal domain is very complex. This is something that is really a bone of contention between the coalition and opposition. And there's this agreement that's also come up in the greeting where we're not going towards annexation or setting up a Palestinian states so there's kind of a the spectrum in between uh, that we're dealing with and each party is kind of pulling towards their own some are talking about advancing peace and some that are close to the prime minister are saying that we're not going to have negotiations and israel usually did come out saying these things we're not talking about with abu mazen or so on we're just seeing israel taking one step forward and one step backward we see on the one hand israeli ministers meeting with their palestinian counterparts and and also we see gestures, the gesture that by the Ministry of Defense to Abu Mazen. But then we also see other steps that seem to be completely contradictory. We see the EU emissary uh, talking about the building in the uh, settlements. We see E1, we see the courts discussing Silwan. So just to look at the vision that's been published by the government and the different ministries, we see that some ministries are talking about deepening the relations with the Palestinian Authority, but other ministries are talking about actually fighting the Palestinian Authority. So we're seeing everything, the whole wide range so we're going to have to see where that's headed. The Palestinian sphere is, of course, very complex, very challenging in and of itself. We're talking about the split also, um, the split between Hamas in Gaza and uh, the PA in the um, West Bank. We see the crisis mostly focusing on the younger generation. We also see our 
social issues with them. And there's also economic, an economic crisis. The money isn't being transferred, and perhaps that will be felt as a kind of a losing of control. The international uh, space, I can say that we still don't see the Israeli-Palestinian issue being top of the agenda. There is no kind of political uh, decision to advance it. Perhaps uh, the Americans are talking about uh, moving the consulate and the quartet really isn't doing very much. We did have a round of discussions at Mitvim with international uh, parties, and they certainly welcomed the change in the government, but they're saying that they're giving us a chance, they're giving us credit, but they do see that there's a gap between declarations being made and what's happening on the ground. That's actually very much what we're seeing. We're seeing the grace period ending, and we're seeing greater international criticism about how statements are okay, meetings are great, but nothing enough, not enough is happening on the ground in terms of the Ministry of Defense and the Ministry of, of of public uh, security. So aside from that, we should also discuss the last uh, the events in last May, uh, the escalation in Gaza and in Jerusalem. That is certainly being discussed by domestic uh, Palestinian and international entities. Uh, the heart of the matter is really the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. We must uh, not overlook it. And to that, we must add the weakness of the Palestinian Authority, which is worrying uh, many, both here in Israel and internationally. We see that Argaman, who just uh, left the Shabak, the ISA, um, was very concerned. He said that Hamas is actually becoming stronger, whereas the PA is getting weaker as a result of Israeli policy. And that's something we need to change. We also see it in our poll. The Israeli public prefers the option of having the Palestinian Authority into Gaza as I will relate to the fact that we should welcome the small steps after mentioning my reservations uh, regarding what's being done on the other side, but we should uh, welcome the fact that there are ministers who are talking about this, that they, that they were holding meetings with senior officials in the PA after many years of a complete disconnect with the exception of Minister Kahlon, who did meet with officials. Uh, these are relatively small steps and there's also the matter of the humanitarian gesture regarding the registration of Palestinian uh, uh, residents who weren't registered to allow them to register them, a small thing, but that makes life easier for a lot of people. And in the last survey that Shkaki uh, published recently was regarding the trust building steps. We can see that 50% of the Palestinians said that they view this as a positive step. So that's something we should advance. And one last point, we talked about uh, diplomatic advancement in many areas with Europe and with uh, Egypt. And this uh, gives an opportunity for tools that can advance steps on the Palestinian Israeli scene as well. Thank you. You also uh, uh, connected uh, Xenia's region to your uh, region. It's a very complex issue. And it's not only the Middle East uh, that is connected to the Palestinian issue and our relations with the Palestinians. I'd like to look northwest a little bit to another region that we belong to and that is relevant to our relations with uh, the Palestinians. That's Europe. Our relations with Europe, with the EU and other countries are critical. They're central for us. And that is despite the fact that we sometimes take them for granted. And we forget the centrality of Europe for security, for our economy, for our relations with the Palestinians. And of course, Europe is involved and has interests in other areas where I Israel is actually so we should be aware of what's happening in this arena, what's happening in Europe, what's happening in the relations between Israel and Europe. And there's no better way I know than to turn to my dear friend, Dr. Amaya Sion uh, Sidkiao, who is uh, uh, who is director of European relations program at the Midvim Institute. Maya, what's happening in Europe? What opportunities does Israel have in uh, Europe now in regard to the Palestinians? We'd like to hear from you. The floor is yours. 
Thank you, Roe. So for lack of time, I will relate to the main challenge in Israel's foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis the uh, European Union, and that is the the diplomatic deadlock in, and I will talk about what's happening there. And the main event is what is not happening in the relations and that there's, there's no uh, uh, convening of the association and the, of the partnership priorities that's been ignored. Without that document, we cannot advance relations with the EU in places that will be uh, beneficial to Israel and to its public. So those that look at the economic relations between Israel and Europe gets a good impression. In the past year, we've seen a rise in trade and in tourism in both directions before Corona, of course, and the economy has not been harmed by the poor political relations or diplomatic relations. And Israel is has it joined it, it is signed a, a, the uh, uh, Horizon Europe for of which involves 95 billion sh euros for the next seven years. It has strategic importance for Israel to keep Israel at the forefront of development in areas that have huge importance, like quantum uh, computing. So you can say, okay, so what's the problem? So we didn't convene the association system, but there are a lot of issues in here. In the there are a lot of lost opportunities in the past decade to widen relations and advancement. The important agreements signed between the EU and Israel were until 2013, and these and opportunities uh, that uh, Olmert as prime minister and Livni as foreign minister were realized. For example, the Open Skies Agreement, which lowered prices and increased the number of uh, destinations and so on. And that is just an example of the potential in the European uh, uh, arena. So the challenge to Foreign Minister Lapid is to open a new page in relations and to release the uh, uh, diplomatic deadlock between the two countries in order also to advance relations and realize additional opportunities. If we look to see why there has been a deadlock in the relations, we can assign a blame to both sides, but I don't have time to get into that. And an article on this subject will soon be published by Mitvim. But I would like to dis mention two s issues, re one uh, regarding uh, Israel's actions vis-a-vis -vis Europe. The EU uh, uh, took the step of linkage that it would not advance relations with Israel until relations with the Palestinians uh, did not advance. And Netanyahu, as you know, did not advance peace with the Palestinians and the Europeans exercised this option. And that is a challenge. And the EU also exercised the uh, uh, distinct, uh, uh, it, it distinguished between Israel within the 67 lines and beyond the 67 lines. And it opposes uh, annexation, uh, creeping annexation by Israel. And this is, is something that the uh, right wing parties in the coalition will dislike very much. And that is to uh, uh, treat the settlements uh, differently. And this agreement seemingly is an obstacle. We cannot expect the EU to change its policy on this matter. So the uh, a policy of linkage and of uh, distinguishing the settlements are problems. And I can't go into all the steps that the Netanyahu uh, government took, but I hope that's behind us. And regard because of these uh, disagreements, Israel uh, is the first of all the uh, Southern Mediterranean countries. It's the only country that doesn't have a program to advance uh, relations. We're talking about 12 years since to announce our uh, neighbors like Jordan, Egypt, Morocco, and Tunisia have signed partnership priorities agreements four or five years ago, and everyone is losing when these opportunities are not being exercised. The Lapid uh, foreign ministry can improve this. He started uh, op turning a new page with your in July, he already visited Brussels and met with the Council of Foreign Ministers, 27 foreign ministers, and the and with Joseph Borrell, 
who's in charge of foreign policy, and he said all the right things uh, within the constraints of the current government. For example, he emphasized that this is a government that uh, uh, believes in liberal dem democracy, free press, and justice, uh, and so on. Uh, and this just, he sent a, a clear uh, uh, hint uh, that the relations with Viktor Orban would not be as close as they were with Netanyahu. But Lapid also put the constraints on the table and he told the foreign ministers that although he believes in the two-state solution, he cannot promise that the diplomatic process will be renewed under this government. And we heard a moment earlier from Lior about that. And Lapid said that his government will seek to improve the quality of life on the humanitarian and so on level with the Palestinians. Will that suffice for the uh, um, for your, for the EU? But uh, when we see th this is an opportunity to, to restore the relations with the EU to a, 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 to more pragmatic relations, and this is very high on Lapid's priorities and how it will be done, we'll hear in the next round. Thank you, Amaya. Very enlightening and thought provoking and We'll get back to this at the next round. If the best way so is to make can... peace with the Palestinians, then we will have the advantages on both sides. It's important to remember that between Israel and Europe, there is another region, the Mediterranean Basin. And in the last, uh, in recent months, it's become uh, very important not just for Israel. When we look westwards, we see an intense arena full of interests and actors and changes. And so to understand more about what's happening there, we have asked Ambassador Miki Harari, policy fellow in the Mediterranean region at Mitvim, to speak. And aside from being a good friend and a very wonderful person, he has also been in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for many years. He was the ambassador of Israel to Cyprus when the warm relations that we witnessed today just began. And we'd like to ask you, Miki, what is happening in this area, in the Mediterranean basin? What are the main trends? What kind of processes are taking place? What should we be noticing? And uh, are there any interesting opportunities opening up? Thank you. Thank you very much, Roi. And it's certainly an area with really fascinating uh, shifts and uh, developments in recent years. I will begin with what Amaya said. She said that compared to Europe, there were missed opportunities and there was a potential of opportunities. I think that the Mediterranean Basin is certainly an area where most of the actors have tapped into the uh, potential and opportunity that came their way. And that is very interesting when it comes to a foreign relation. I will focus on three main points and I will leave the challenges to the next round. The first point that we should say is that today, after almost a decade of uh, developments in the Eastern Mediterranean Basin, this area has become both in terms of Israel's foreign policy and looking at it regionally as Israel is doing, and more importantly, or just as importantly, from the international community's uh, perspective, the nearer one and one that's further away. I took part in a conference overseas last week, and the question came up, not from uh, Israeli participants per se, about the Mediterranean identity. We know that it's come up many years ago. I don't think that we can uh, leap directly and uh, say that there is such an identity, say that it's been formed, but I do think that it attests considerably to these uh, regional uh, sort of outlook. Another point I want to emphasize is that in recent years, a series of very interesting relations have been formed. Certainly the triangles, the Israeli, Cypriot, Greek triangle. And aside from the success of the closer relations between these three countries. And it's very surprising to see that things have developed there and have uh, actually advanced there quite rapidly. I think that what's really nice to see arithmetically and strategically and politically is that this 
triangle, this trilateral relationship is very successful. Other countries have tried, some have been successful, to uh, duplicate it. Uh, the Greek Cypriot Egyptian triangle is just as successful. And there have been attempts to develop such triangles with Jordan, the PA, and to a certain extent with UAE. What I'm trying to say is that this basis, this framework that was um, unique to Israel, Cyprus, and Greece because of the Turkish uh, angle, among other things, has become a kind of a positive role model for others in the region. And the third point is that this regional architecture that has developed in recent years, I think that the formal or bureaucratic or regional expression of it is the, reg the IMGF, the uh, Regional Gas Forum. We have eight states as members of it. And certainly this forum expresses the real combination of interests in the region because of the natural gas being discovered. And I think that at least among some of its members, there is a meeting point of strategic interest that is very, very important between Israel, Egypt, Cyprus, Greece, and so these eight members have managed to find a way to be friendly in an interesting regional way. And we'll see where it will evolve. There is another uniqueness in this regional architecture of the um, Natural Gas Forum. It is a regional structure that was initiated by locals. It's not the Barcelona process. It's then they're important, of course, in and of itself and in of themselves. But this structure has been fed and was built, and at present, quite successfully at least, by proactiveness of some of the local countries. I will stop here and I will save the challenges for the next round. Oi, thank you. Thank you very much, Miki. We're already waiting. We see that uh, when we're talking about different regions or different areas, it's almost artificial because there are ties between them all. And it's impossible to overlook the fact that one of the main things that are impacting what's happening in the Middle East is very far away, the United States. Many of the processes and trends that you have mentioned until now are a derivative of or are associated with the U.S. policy in the region and in general, even Israel-U.S. relations. So we don't have to explain why it's important to understand what's happening there within the United States and in our relations with the United States. Of course, it's important to do that. I would like to hear from Nadav Tamir, Executive Director of J Street and member of Mitvim's Board of Directors. Nadav, please tell us what's happening in the United States. How can we describe the U.S. Thanks, everyone. Of course, the United States-Israel relations area is huge. But when I first reached the Israeli embassy in Washington, I tried to divide the relations in to three areas, VIP, values, interests, and politics. And I think that in each of these areas, we saw very trends of great concern over the last few years. Of course, the foundation and basis are very strong and we don't have time to talk about how we share the values and how we share interests and politics in general. But the problematic trends have to do with the fact that in terms of values, the state of Israel for many years has shifted dramatically from these values of its inception, of its independence that has had so much to do with the American constitution and the demographic trend in both countries shows that it's not going to improve because in the United States, every new baby born has a greater chance of being liberal and in Israel, every new baby born has a greater chance of being conservative. So in terms of the interests, the eye of the VIP, if in the past, the Middle East was a very important, a very influential area for the United States because of energy and, of course, because of the Cold War with the 
former Soviet Union and counterterrorism. Currently, the Middle East is far less interesting and has nothing to do with a certain president one way or the other. It is just a matter of strategy. All the interventions in the Middle East were a colossal uh, failure. And of course, the shift is now going into Asia in terms of energy. And so the motto of the United of Israel in the United States, which was bipartisanship, has all been trampled altogether by Netanyahu and Trump. And all the more so when both Trump and Netanyahu um, made sure that they were trampling it. And the traces or the echoes of uh, this um, trampling remain. And the traditional pro-Israeli entities also have now a huge gap between them and the American jury that no longer sees this approach of Israel's always right as something that they are bound by. And so all sorts of gaps have formed that were very substantial. And the new government in Israel and the new US administration have done or have taken several steps in order to correct it, but it's not enough. Certainly there is an effort by the Lapid Bennett government to restore uh, these relations with the Democrats, with the American Jews, on the other hand, there is no way that this restoration or this rehabilitation will be enough, certainly in view of the demographic changes and the politics of opportunities that is very prevalent in the United States, unless there is a substantial step in the Palestinian uh, domain. And the statement to this announcement that there will be no dramatic move toward a solution or toward annexation that already was problematic we now see that in certain areas, and Marie has already mentioned it, this government is even taking several steps back when it comes to the Palestinians. And we saw the announcement of the human rights organizations, E1, um, Givat Hamatos, all of these areas uh, that even uh, Netanyahu was uh, wary of uh, discussing. And so this administration is saying, you don't want Netanyahu back, right? So don't force us to move the consulate and don't badger us, but what can we do? Even if Biden really wants to keep this a uh, low priority because he has so many other things to engage in, the Democratic Party is certainly engaging in it, and they will certainly pressure him. And so we are seeing a gap. And even this shared approach that we shouldn't uh, do anything substantial or anything dramatic in this area, both Bennett and Biden don't want to do that. So there's a lot to correct, but we'll talk about that in the next round. Thank you very much, Nadav. So let's now move on to the second round. Okay, so you have described what we now have, what has changed in each arena. And reality is complex and the different areas are intertwined. I will now be very delighted, very much delighted if you will be able to focus on some recommendations. What should Israel do in view of these shifts and changes? What should the foreign policy be? What should Israel refrain from? Thank you, Ori. So perhaps we'll start with what we shouldn't do, the don'ts because we are now at a time that is really so different in so many ways. And the shifts that are taking place can be felt through the social media and the Arab world and the Arab media and all kinds of suggestions and proposals that are coming into Israel from Egypt. When was the last time that Egypt asked us to expand the economic ties, not since the 1980s. So first of all, we shouldn't miss the opportunities that are being presented. They are there on the table, but they may not be there in six months, 12 months, 15 or 18 months, because there are many fish in the sea. And that's true for many things in our lives. Certainly when there is an open market, a free market, and there is a, such a great um, supply, collaboration between countries. So we shouldn't ignore 
them when this hand re is reaching out to us, when, when they reach out to us, we shouldn't ignore it, there's a reason for it. Another don't is to be arrogant and to ignore the interests of our partners. We should make sure that we treat them with respect. The current government is already uh, working very differently. I'm talking, of course, about Jordan, which is the country that was perhaps uh, harmed most over the last few years uh, by uh, Israel's disregard. The foreign policy must be founded on shared interests, but also on shared respect. And when we talk about respect, it means sharing. It means involving these actors with everything we can. No, I'm not saying everything, but what we can. Of course, we're a sovereign, free country, and we make our own decisions, and that's fine. But at the same time, if we allow them a kind of stronghold or, or a, a kind of a presence, allow them to perhaps advise us, as part of our foreign policy, let's say a, a director generals of Minister of Foreign Affairs for a level. These countries that are perhaps, uh, you know, have been in peace, at peace with us for longer. Uh, even when it comes to the Palestinians, when it comes to Temple Mount, this is nothing binding. This is not an organization that will be receiving making decisions for us god forbid but at the same time when you allow these people to voice their opinion and to consult with them they have the experience they have the connections and you ask them what do you think what do you think maybe if we want another another stair to be built uh, in, in a certain area should we have um should we have metal detectors up on the mountain do you think it'll have an impact Again, if we want to build long-term relations and to ensure that they remain strong, that's what needs to happen. I already said during the first round about long-term planning, plans that have real human break in them, because that's what really helps these connections, these ties stay, stay true. We see in our relations with Egypt, it is the military officials who continue to be in touch over the years. They had to be connected, they had to be in touch. And so, yes, we do have ties that are social, that are long-term, that have to do not just with security, that are much broader than what was maybe even initially planned, but it can also be true in other areas. And since we already have this opportunity to get another foot in this door that's being opened in, uh, to us, then we should make take advantage of it. And let's go back to the Palestinians, uh, again, in the context of uh, what uh, Dr. Lez said, Israel must always remember that every small change, every turn for the worse, every indication of an outburst or a an intifada, will not uh, stop us from economic agreements with other states or from reaching an agreement. Even after May, our agreements have withstood it. Even though there is an Islamist, the prime minister who is no longer with us, the Gulf states too, uh, have and, and our relationships with them have survived. So yes, it does have a, some sort of effect on the human fabric. And I speak with people who are very young. I speak with people who are so excited and enthusiastic about uh, the relationship with Israel. And then after the operation in Gaza, they were very upset. And usually we don't hear these voices because we don't hear everything that's happening there. Not, not everything comes out, but still Jordan, Egypt, and even the UAE, where there was no BDS, now there is more BDS. So we mustn't ignore it. We mustn't overlook the Palestinians. And when we talk about integrating and combining, then yes, we should combine engaging in the Palestinian issue and perhaps involving our partners um, in consulting with them. That is the right way of promoting our foreign policy and having it balanced.
Thank you very much, Roi. I certainly can agree with what's been said. Let's begin with the final words that I said, the steps that I do see, that we do see. And when we look at that, we can see, look at the collaborations, look at the dialogue and see that it becomes more substantial, to deepen it, to really concretize our communication channels, not just meetings here and there between ministers, but really different levels of connections and ties make it something that can really take keep going, not just with each government, change them and rebuild them, whether it's from the center, whether it's from the right, the right wing, the left wing, Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, we should re-strengthen these ties. We should also think about uh, the division of work. We see how we have the Ministry of Regional Cooperation, the Ministry of Defense, and it's very important, especially when we look at outlining and see what's happening in the future. After the crisis with Cuba, one of the main ideas was to find the kind of hotline or to, uh, between uh, the United States and Cuba, just to stop such a crisis from happening again. So again, it's very important that uh, the top echelons in both countries will be in touch, or maybe if it's not Bennett, but a leadership level, it's very important to keep in touch. And as I've said, it's just part of the picture. And therefore, we must have a kind of com complementary uh, step being taken on the ground. We can't just talk about gestures and statements and heads of state visits. We need it to be on the ground. And we heard in our dialogue with international parties and the Palestinians that when we have a gesture on the one hand, but then something that is happening on the ground that is completely opposite, that's what's going to, that's what the people on the ground are going to remember. And if there's a contradiction, then all of these things that have to do with the area, sea area and settlements and E1 and East Jerusalem, we all know what we're talking about. We can't separate between certain gestures and what's actually happening on the ground. It's all one and the same. And we heard that from many international parties. No one's asking for a permanent agreement. No one's asking us to go into uh, peace negotiations, but we must take steps that, first of all, will not impede such a process and will, will not lead to escalation, at least. And another thing that we need to do is to make sure that we need to not just see the economic side or the political side, we need to look at infrastructure that is really being for the, built, built for the future, for the next generations of Palestinians and Israelis. It's not just baby steps, and it's not just economic peace, the way we used to call it in the past. It's something that it's a challenge that we need to grapple with. And I want to agree with what's been said when it comes to leveraging the local qualities. We saw that in the survey, both the right wing and left wing want to uh, tap into the potential of normalization and to have it uh, impact the Palestinian uh, issue. We're going to have a uh, conference in a week's time marking 30 years to the Madrid conference. And it is something that needs to happen. We know it's difficult and complex. Many parties, many people are trying to decide how to do it. It's complex. Also, uh, there are certain, some complex relations even between our new partners, uh, normalized states and Palestinians. And so we need to set up the kind of establishments that will allow for this to happen. The old peace countries, the new normalization countries. And another point that I want to mention, and I think that we're already seeing sh changes and shifts in Minister of Foreign Affairs Lapid's approach. And we're seeing that the policy is more open. And what's very important is not to worry about the intervention of the international entities, not to worry about international parties, making a, a difference. We see that there are visits and it's okay to make sure that we can tap into it, that we can make good use of it. It can be relevant for strengthening the Palestinians. It's relevant for a change in the Gaza Strip. And it could be relevant when it comes to, again, building infrastructure and forging ties and promoting not the maybe short term, but the longer term of values and negotiations in the future. Thank you very Thank you, much, Lior. Lior. How does it look from Europe, Maya? So let me give you a number of recommendations, step. The first is, of course, to turn a new page with 
relations with Europe in general, with the EU specifically. I'm talking about specific parts, of course, Western Europe and with the EU. And this recommendation involves practical steps, and I'll divide them into internal Israeli steps and steps towards Europe. Internally, the first recommendation is that the government hold a discussion in the cabinet regarding its policies and what it plans to do regarding Europe. That's not something that's being done, and perhaps the time has come for that. Dr. Lior Ler spoke earlier about that the right hand is doing the opposite or differently from the left hand. And for example, the construction in the settlements is not consistent with the European uh, agenda. And uh, we heard uh, the spokesperson talking uh, about, about an hour ago about the expected construction in the settlements, and that is inconsistent with the effort to uh, turn a new page and advance relations. And the second thing is that we have to position the EU as a an ally and a friend, not as a rival in the internal discourse, as we've saw in the survey of Mitvim, that 46% uh, of the population see Europe as a rival. And even if there are disagreements, it's a disagreement among friends and the channels of dialogue must remain open on all levels. And that is what the government must advance as it is with the Palestinians. And the second thing is to have an interministerial uh, uh, entity to consolidate the list of opportunities for upgrading relations and for development and with special attention to an examination of the possibilities of uh, renegotiating an economic agreement regarding services. Uh, we have, for example, uh, Georgia and Moldavia recently signed and Morocco and Tunis have uh, started negotiations with the EU on this type of agreement. There's no reason why Israel should remain behind. And we need the Ministry of the Economy, the Treasury and Foreign Ministry to join hands on this. And if, Another thing is uh, uh, the recommendation of Mitvim Institute, not only to deepen relations with the EU by opening negotiations on new agreements, but also uh, those that involve the settlements we must embrace despite the survey of the Mitvim Institute where 47% of the Israeli public believed that we should not get involved in uh, agreements that uh, um, make a, a separate arrangement for the settlements uh, as opposed to 36% that believed it should. And the, uh, the government knows how important agreements with Europe are for our uh, economy. And my second recommendation relates to Europe to strengthen ties uh, with countries that have uh, uh, Western uh, liberal uh, governments. And this should be used to reconvene the Council of Associations in order to uh, uh, open uh, negotiations on partnership priorities, to point to priorities in the relations. Um, uh, Yair Lapid's speech was a very good opening shot and uh, the meeting with the foreign minister of Sweden also, and these steps should be continued all the more so with a special focus on the camp that is critical of Israel. This camp has shrunk in the EU, there's a small number of countries and France, which is weighing its uh, uh, steps. And that's where the key is to change. And we must and uh, should invite Joseph Borrell to Jerusalem and Ursula uh, von der Leyen, the president of the EU. We should uh, consider whether uh, Prime Minister uh, Naftali Bennett should perhaps travel to Brussels or to Paris and to take advantage of the presidency of France that begins in 2022 after the presidency of the Czech Republic, which is friendly to Israel to advance these steps. I would like to relate to one thing that Xenia mentioned and Lear also mentioned that we can enlist the EU to actualize opportunities and deepen uh, uh, cooperation, regional cooperations uh, 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 that the EU, uh, 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 EU's southern Mediterranean neighbors, and uh, there is a great deal of money up to 2027. And even if, quote unquote, 10% is open for uh, co -op regional cooperation, projects. We're still talking about uh, 700 million shekels that can be uh, very, very helpful. Israel, Jordan, the UAE, Morocco, and even Sudan. Um, we, the final point should be connected to the ambitious uh, European agenda uh, regarding climate change and the Green Deal. This uh, approach is 
dictating more and more of the policy of the EU and will impact many different areas of policy, agriculture, energy, research, education, and so on and so forth. And we'll hear more about that later. So uh, the, uh, the neighbors of Israel are very, very important for our security and for our fabric of life. And in terms of the normative democratic liberal cooperation with Europe and the EU, those are the most important partner after the United States for Israel and the relations with it are very complex ups and downs and uh, d uh, differences in policy towards Israel and this entire uh, complexity uh, is the result of the occupation and the absence of a solution to the Palestinian issue in the uh, context of the constraints of the current uh, government. W uh, effort should be put into improving uh, relations and restoring the trust. Thank you, Maya. You mentioned all the regions in your final uh, 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 sentence. We see that everything is connected and from the Southern neighborhood to in Europe to and the climate crisis. Mickey, that brings you to you. What's happening there? That's the part I love to point to the challenges as it were. After we focus on the trends and developments, I look about five main points. The first is something that seems obvious, and that is to preserve the existing situation, not to rest on our laurels of the past few years. But as I said in the first part, when I spoke, some very important cooperations have been consolidated. They must be preserved. The second point is very challenging, and that is Turkey. Turkey is outside the entire regional scene that has developed. Part of it is because of its own choices, as it were. Uh, in any case, it's not healthy for Israel's foreign relations. The challenge here is very significant. It's not unilateral. It's not only an Israeli challenge. It's both Israeli and international. Europe and the US and of Turkey itself, of course. And what is important, and that's why I'm pointing to the challenge and not necessarily to the concrete aspects, it is important to find a creative way, that's a word we use a lot, to somehow integrate Turkey in this regional discourse. I reiterate, it, Turkey is not making it easy for us to do that and not for any of the other actors either, but it's an important actor to be included. And in recent years, especially the past two years, the tension that has been going up and down, it, and there's some very clear Turkish messages, uh, and we feel uncomfortable at being ignored. And I think Israel needs to enter into a kind of mode, a psychological mode where there's no contradiction and it's not a zero sum game. The third point, is also aimed at a problematic and very challenging actor, and that's Lebanon. Lebanon is a very complicated story in its own right. I can't get into it, of course, now. Uh, but in terms of regional energy, it's important, and we can't ignore that there's a new American envoy, Amos Hochstein, and their efforts to renew the negotiations. And I think Karin al the Ministry of Energy, said Israel is willing to look at creative solutions. And we have to look at it. And it's a very big if, how, if and how this very deep crisis with Lebanon can be perhaps enlisted for some kind of compromise in this context. Lebanon needs it no less than we do. The fourth point, and it has already been mentioned, is the climate crisis. On the one hand, it's a crisis, but on the other hand, it's also an opportunity to develop collaborations seemingly on a neutral basis, there shouldn't be any serious objection to that. We've recently heard, for example, one example from Jordan about their desire to position itself as a hub of renewable energy. That's wonderful. Beyond the self-evident idea itself, 
what we're seeing here is an expression on the part of Jordan uh, that it wants uh, to contribute to the uh, region and not only take from the region, for example, water from Israel. And the last point is related to what Lior said and the Palestinian issue. It is tempting to say that it would be a good idea to enlist the regional aspect to the Palestinian issue. On the other hand, I think that some of the regional actors, even the Arabs, don't necessarily want to enlist the regional issue for the diplomatic effort, but it can. we can look at some projects that can be advanced vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinian Authority. For example, the gas field near Gaza. Hamas is, of course, a major actor in this aspect, but this could somehow uh, drive processes vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians, even if at the outset are not diplomatic. It may create a discourse and create action and momentum. Momentum by definition is a wonderful thing. Momentum is underrated in my opinion. So let's make it overrated as it were. Thank you very much, Miki. Nadav, you're sitting there at the far, far west. How should we be grappling with this complexity with the uncle in the United States? Well, in the third uh, sort of foundations of VIP values, interests in politics, the most uh, fundamental thing we can do is something in the Palestinian arena. And all those who spoke before me have mentioned it, so there's no need to reiterate, but there, we cannot really correct much without making a step in the Palestinian arena. And I think there are some other things we can do as well under the current circumstances. When it comes to the values, one of the things that are the most important for Israel to connect to the progressive public in the United States, which is very important in the Democratic Party, but also in the Jewish community, is I would suggest that Israel set up another binational foundation. We have three of them, Baird Bart in the SS. We should have another foundation that has to do with Tikkun Olam, that connects the two countries, that leverages the capabilities of both countries, and also connects the Peace Corps, perhaps, kind of like a Peace Corps of young people from Israel and the United States who can do things in developing countries. I think that can certainly have a tremendous impact. Another thing that I would like to say when it comes to interests, of course, the fact that the United States has stepped away from the Middle East is a very difficult problem for Israel. We can already see in Syria how the Sykes-Picot is, is lifting, uh, is again happening. Uh, the United States is not there, but Russia is. Two things can keep the United States in the loop and in the region, and both of them are very difficult for Israel. The first, that as part of some arrangement to the Palestinians, we will go back to General Allen's suggestion who wrote uh, to Kerry how uh, the United States can be involved in protecting the Israel's eastern border, which I believe will leave the United States in the region. And another thing that Israel is unwilling to hear, but when they understand that it's that it must happen, it's necessary, maybe they'll think about it, is a kind of a uh, contractual defense alliance that will lead the United States to be more um, involved in terms of boots on the ground and will also provide the United States with a proactive interest to export capabilities to Israel. And I think this is a huge interest, certainly in a situation where Iran may become a nuclear threshold state. Another uh, of course, in the political context, uh, the Bennett Lapid government is making an effort to um, restore the bipartisan ties. But again, they're only looking at the right wing part of the Democratic Party, those who are closer to APEC, and they are completely ignoring what's happening in uh, the progressive part. And I think, and in the caucus, in the progressive caucus, there are 100 uh, congressmen and uh, congress members and uh, senators, and Israel must uh, create a constructive uh, dialogue with them. Uh, we have to do the same with the Americans. We have to make sure that we treat 
things complexly, but even if someone is pro-Palestinian, um, we have to deal with them, and uh, Lapid has to see what they did with Europe and do the same here. We also have to do something about uh, the Jewish community now that we have Lapid and Lieberman and Bennett and not the ultra-Orthodox in the uh, coalition. I think that this is a huge opportunity to really restore and rehabilitate the terrible damage that the state of Israel has caused uh, to, with all the uh, non-Orthodox denominations, making them feel like second-rate Jews. I think that can be very significant and substantial to our ability to uh, have the Jewish community in the United States connected to Israel. So now, Roe, it's over to you to sum up this part of the panel. Thank you very much, Nadav. I would like to thank you. I would like to actually keep talking to you, but we have a conference uh, to get through, so we'll have coffee later. But I'd like to thank you, Xenia, Lior, Maya, Miki, and Nadav. It was fascinating. It really feels like it really was the tip of the iceberg in just the beginning, but with a few points that have been raised within this discussion, a few key thoughts. When we look at the uh, significant challenges that Israel is facing, then sometimes together with that, opportunities also emerge for Israel that we must uh, use. I am leaving this panel with the idea and the thought that even though the Israeli government is comprised of members who have different ideologies, different views about uh, the desirable policy, there are also many issues which you've mentioned that despite the complexity, we can find an agreement on, we can uh, find a, con a consensus over. You've mentioned several of them. Um, making the normalization into a stronger, warmer relationship. Uh, Xenia uh, spoke about that in the Gulf uh, with Morocco. I think it's something that can certainly be supported uh, across the board, improving the relationship with the Democratic Party. Uh, Nadav, you just mentioned that also uh, um, with the Jewish uh, American community. I think that can be agreed uh, by all the parts of the coalition to expand uh, the relationships and the collaborations in the East Mediterranean Basin, uh, um, expanding the gas forum so that it will focus not only on what's called natural gas, but to make it a forum that can really um, be a forum that will accompany the whole process of parting with uh, fossil fuels and so on. Uh, to strengthen the connections with the peace countries, Egypt and Jordan, that's also something that can be done. Strengthening the relations with the EU, we see that that can also be done, and at least in some places. Restoring the ties with Turkey, if it, there is uh, support for it and the government chooses to do that, it can garner such support. These are all steps that can be taken, perhaps not easily, but to a certain extent to, to create a consensus um, over. And the most complicated issue in this context is, of course, the Palestinian one. It is complicated in and of itself, and it is more complicated when there are no political agreements with, uh, among the different components of the government, and you've mentioned that as well. They are impacted and they are all derived from it. And therefore, you said that each and every one of you, that we cannot overlook the Palestinian issue. We cannot just uh, skip over it. It impacts Israel's relations in every arena. And this government will have uh, to address it, even if it said it would set, a, set it aside uh, to start with. And we're not just talking about minimizing the conflict, which is important in and of itself, but also building an infrastructure for a life of peace. And even if we, it'll take time before we get to peace negotiations, again, we need to create the infrastructure now, even if there is no prospect and there is no forecast for you know, starting a whole peace process, taking these steps, building this infrastructure, this, these peace building steps is very important. So thank you all very much. I'd like to thank you again.